Welcome again to Public Perspective. I'm your host, Kevin McDermott. And tonight we'll be talking about mysteries. Actually, we have as our guest tonight, author Robert Goldsboro, who has taken it upon himself to renew and continue the series of Nero Wolfe, the famed private detective. So we'll talk a little bit about private detectives and film noir literature and uh, enjoy ourselves with some of the, the fiction and some of the things that we can examine through, the, through our own lives through that fiction. So Mr. Goldsboro, Welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have it's you here. It's great to be here. So you've uh, taken it upon yourself to honor the uh, the memory of Rex Stout and how he wrote about his detective, Nero mm -hmm. Wolf. Um, do you sometimes feel it's big shoes to fill? Do you worry about whether or not you can really be true to the spirit and character? I do. I do because there are so many fans out there, and Rex Stout wrote about 70 novels, novellas, and short stories. So... There is so much lore that is woven into the Nero Wolf books that I'd better be as faithful as possible. And when I'm not, and I, there have been, I've had lapses, and I've heard from uh, I would bet aficionados. The fans would you know, right? Oh yes, yeah, you got the room on the wrong side of the hall, mm -hmm. or something. Like that. There are all kinds of details that are you better know pretty well. But it's, a, it's actually a tribute to, um, first of all, to Rex Stout, who, that his novels are still read so many years. He, was, he wrote mostly in the 20s, 30s. Up Started to in the 30s and wrote yeah. until his, almost until his death in the late 70s. So it's mm -hmm. about a 44-decade span. Um, so uh, his novels have clearly resonated with the American public. Uh, so speaking of that resonance, um, what is it about these novels that resonated with you that made you want to pick up and continue? Well, my mother introduced me to them when I was a teenager, uh, thinking they were the kind of literature that a boy could uh, read without being uh, shocked, because they're essentially, these are uh, whodunits. They're, uh, they're mind games, and they don't have a lot of four-letter words, none, actually, uh, and they don't have a lot of sex, only by barest suggestion, and usually the murders take place off stage. There's not a lot of violence and gore. There are murders, of course, and uh, the, the, the real joy of the story is trying to guess which of the half dozen or so suspects did the dirty deed. In fact, uh, Roger Ebert, the film critic, uh, yeah. famously said about movies, um, he, he calls it, uh, I think it was economy of characters or... or um, uh, the preservation of characters, it was, uh, his phrase essentially meant that somewhere you've already met the killer or whatever it is, the person who did the deed, whatever mm -hmm. that deed is, yeah. um, that economy of characters was such that you didn't, someone didn't suddenly appear late in the book whom you hadn't seen yet. That's correct. There is something in, in the whodunits, which is a particular form of, of the genre, that is called the doctrine of fair play. And in that, it, it it means that the reader should be able or could be able to figure out the uh, ending because of clues that are sprinkled mm -hmm. through the book. Now those clues are sometimes pretty obscure because you don't want people to f uh, figure out the story too easily or it's no fun. Right. Uh, any any whodunit that's too easy to solve just isn't a very good one. Do you get some of that from, from the fans as well, the Nero Wolf fans? They look and say, you know, this is uh, not quite, or it's a little better, or it's not as hard to figure it out. I, I, I haven't had too much of that. M most of what I get from the critics uh, are nitpicks about things that I they didn't feel uh, I got quite right. Mm. Maybe uh, it's in a recurring character. And they're, one of the nice things about the Nero Wolf books is there's an ensemble company of about 20 recurring characters, some of them come into the books more often than others, but they all have certain traits about them. And, you know, some of them are kind of eccentric people. Mm -hmm. Wolf himself. Uh, it's quite eccentric. It's quite eccentric. But I'd better be careful about the way I present the people, or I'm going to uh, have uh, something come down on my head in the way of pretty <laughs> harsh criticism. And I get it. I, you know, you have to grow up a, a thick skin. Uh, because I've, I've attempted to take over from someone else, and that, uh, that's tricky, or it can be. So what's the advantage to you as a writer, um, rather than creating a, a new world or a new set of characters, uh, what does it, f now certainly there's constraints in following a, a set path, yes. um, 
But what else does it allow you to do that you might not otherwise do if you had to create your own entire, an entirely universe of your own? Well, uh, I mean, and I have written uh, other mysteries with my mm -hmm. own characters, too, uh, set in the Chicago area. But uh, it, it allows me to sometimes stretch some of these characters that Rex Stout created because some of them don't appear uh, very often in his books. And it's kind of fun to take somebody who maybe has only been in a few of his 70 or 80 uh, works to, mm -hmm. and bring them out on center stage. Uh, and, and embellish a little bit on their lives. So there is some creativity there mm -hmm. w within this this overall structure that you have to be true to. There, you can you can take uh, Stout created enough characters that you you've got some flexibility, and that can be a lot of fun. Well, actually, I can I can understand that. I would think that particularly if you uh, read through the novels and you see a particular character who doesn't get a lot of um, front front stage time. Uh, and, and you might think, gee, what is this character really like? Mm -hmm. And this allows you to explore that. Right? Yeah, and add, add a little bit of depth to the character. But trying all the while to keep that character true to the, the impression you, you've gotten of mm -hmm. him in Mr. Stout's books. I mean, I don't want to run roughshod over... Uh, the, the characterizations. So, well, as you say, you but do I want to fans. Yeah, I, I want to. Yes, I do. I have, they're, they're watching. They are <laughs> watching. Well, actually, I'm sure that's reassuring as well that, that people are reading your books as well. well Same fan base. Yeah, it, and, they, and they keep you honest too. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've written mea culpa letters to people about things that I didn't get right. And I said, I won't do that again. I promise. <laughs> <laughs> I had a guy. Uh, tell me, <coughs> I had Archie Goodwin, the narrator of these books, eating a stack of wheat cakes in the kitchen, uh, which he had a little table in the kitchen where he had breakfast. And this man wrote me and said, no, no, he never ate a stack of wheat cakes. The chef that they had, the live-in chef, always gave him one wheat cake at a time so they were hot off the griddle. <laughs> and I... He said, I, I can't, I don't know where it is in the book, but I, and then about a week later, he found the, uh, and, uh, sent, and, and sent me a, a photocopy of a page in which he said, uh, Fritz Brenner, the chef, uh, gave Archie one wheat cake and then started making another one on the griddle. So that's the last time I had him eat a stack <laughs> of them. That's the kind of thing that, yeah. that can trip you up. And boy, that's pretty obscure as well. Yeah, well, it's a, a, a lot like the um, Sherlock Holmes stories. There are, there's a whole body of people who study those stories and know chapter, verse, and, uh, and sentence. Um, and the, the Nero Wolf followers are actually quite similar to that. So what is it about the detective character? You know, this is a recurring theme, not just in literature, in movies. And it has held sway for uh, many decades in, in American popular culture. Mm -hmm. it, it arose, I believe, in the 20s, 30s. Um, in, in the era of the Depression and, and Prohibition. Mm -hmm. First of all, how did this character come to be in literature, and, and what's so important? What's its link to American culture, you think? Well, the detective is, has been seen kind of as a, a knight uh, who is pursuing uh, right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Justice. <laughs> Justice. Uh, and they, uh, I mean, they can be kind of grubby guys with a little corner office uh, over a saloon or something and you've seen you read a lot of that and see see some of it in on film and mm -hmm. in, on TV too I mean they're not always uh, a clean cut necessarily but almost all of the continuing detectives that have been created over the years like uh, oh Philip Marlowe mm -hmm. uh, and Sam Spade right. who was played Dash by a lot of people and Dashiell Hammett Sam Spade uh, most notably Humphrey Bogart, mm -hmm. th they were basically on the side of the angels. Yes. And uh, they, they, they were more, uh, these are in a way morality pieces. I mean, they're, some of them are kind of grimy morality <laughs> pieces, but, but they're, I, th I think that uh, the, the detective story is, is very often a morality tale. And the, the people on the other side of the morality tale frequently tend to be the very wealthy. Yes. And, yes, and they so do. So what do, I mean, what do we think that these authors were, and especially since it, this genre seemed to have been created largely around or shortly after the Depression, is there a societal connection there that you think? Well, I, I uh, there may be. Uh, it's it's fun to 
place the detective in a scene where there is great wealth. Um, maybe and maybe the wealthy person is one of the guiltiest people in the story, mm -hmm. uh, as as certainly frequently happens. happens right? Yes, uh, part of the reason, of course, that wealthy people are in these stories is they can pay a detective a greater amount of money in the way of a fee. Uh, in mm -hmm. the case of Nero Wolf, it's particularly true because he lives in a, an opulent lifestyle in a brownstone in which he has a live-in chef. He has gourmet meals uh, every day at noon in the, in the evening. On the roof of his brownstone, he raises 10,000 orchids in a climate-controlled greenhouse that sits up on the fourth floor of this New York brownstone. Spends four hours a day, I understand. Spends there, two yeah. hours in the morning, two hours in the afternoon. Rigid schedule. He uh, is usually reading three books at once. He, he drinks prodigious amounts of beer, uh, which is a pedestrian thing. But I would have thought, uh, if I had been creating Nero Wolf, I would have had him be a connoisseur of fine wines. But that's... That's okay. I mean, that, this is one of the things that makes him so interesting, the way Rex Stout created him. Well, also during the Depression, all booze was off limits, and so beer may well have been uh -huh. his choice because you know, none of it could be obtained easily. Well, maybe, maybe not. And uh, uh, I've, I've referred to that in, in this book, Archie Meets Nero Wolf. Mm -hmm. I've, uh, Wolf, in that book, I had to figure out a way for him to get beer, and so he just states it at one point that he gets his beer from Canada, from Toronto, because Canada did not have prohibition. And a man, he, he did a big favor for a man once in, in Toronto, and that man now sends cases of beer to him in the, in the uh, prohibition era through a route I, chose, I choose not to specify. <laughs> <laughs> so, in a way, yeah. I have Nero Wolf be a rum runner, you know, <laughs> or the recipient. Or at least of, yeah. the recipient, yeah. yes. Yeah. He, but like all detectives, he knows people who are kind of straddling the, the line yes. between legal yep. and illegal. Absolutely, and, and you see a lot of that in detective fiction. Uh, detectives very often have uh, sources out on the street who are, uh, live, have lived on both sides of the law, and they can use them uh, as an, an, an informer or a, a source. To in fact, the detective himself, and if you look to read through the literature, and even in some of the movies, though, more so I think in the older literature, is sort of a gray figure, you know, yeah. somewhere hovering in that area yeah, between very much so. legal and illegal. Yeah, very much so. I, I say that he's a knight, but he's a, he's a, mm -hmm. he can be a, t or she in some cases yeah. certainly, can be a mm -hmm. tarnished knight. And there, there have been... Uh, there's a New York writer named Lawrence Block who has a character who uh, has, has been a thief, uh, a stealthy, almost a cat burglar type of thief, and he's a detective now, and, uh, and uh, sometimes the police will hire him um, because, you know, they, they can... They, yeah, they can use his services. Yeah, they know how he thinks. Yeah, they know, yeah, right. He, he is can be but, invaluable. And I'm also fascinated by the, the idea of the detective as being morally flawed as well, not necessarily morally, but just an imperfect person yes. who, who understands the ambiguities and the gray areas yes. of life yeah. and, and is familiar with the idea that good people can cross the line and bad people can sometimes be good and, yeah. and, and is very, in that way, very impartial about whom that detective deals with. Mm -hmm. A detective might be an alcoholic, and mm -hmm. been, had been divorced, Maybe have even had a uh, had a criminal past, or at least some, you know, as you say, live on the edge. Uh, so that, yes, they are absolutely, and and that aren't flawed people more interesting to read about? Well, certainly, uh, yeah. because uh, if you want to identify with someone with a character, we all know where we fall down in <laughs> yeah, our own yeah, life, yeah, right? Right, right. Uh, so we don't want to read about someone who's perfect, because no. uh, how can we relate to that? I, I remember having someone say to me, they got. They got started on the Nancy Drew mysteries, uh, and and loved them, but were concerned that she was flawless. <laughs> yeah, yes. and and yes. uh, and, and uh, the the woman who mentioned this to me said, you know, I thought about uh, writing that kind of mysteries, but I uh, I, I was almost intimidated by her yeah. as, a, as a character. Yeah. Well, I would think that um, not being an author myself, but I would think you can explore more interesting areas of human interaction. Um, by working with a character who, who has flaws yes. and who has seen all sides mm -hmm. of life. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, for instance, if, it, if it's a, 
a divorced uh, man uh, or woman, uh, you know, they, they are frequently uh, um, depressed about that situation. And, you know, of course, if, if they are divorced, it gives you the opportunity to create uh, the possibility of a romance. Mm -hmm. uh, or in, the, in one of my favorite characters, Philip Marlowe, who, who seems to have been, um, and there's just not, not enough backstory to know, but he seems very jaded and very wary. Yeah. And although certainly he's approached by women, he's uh -huh. so suspicious. Yeah. He just doesn't want to get yeah. go down that road. And uh, and a lot of the detectives, uh, in, in particularly in the golden era of the 20s, 30s, and 40s, were tended to be world weary yes. because they'd seen a lot. I, I, to me, one of the great portrayals. Well, certainly Humphrey Bogart in The Maltese Falcon, but Robert Mitchum playing Philip Marlowe in Farewell, My Lovely. Yes. He was older then, but that's okay because Marlowe got older and Mitchum captured this world-weary uh, feeling, I thought, so well in that film. I it did came see out that. in the 70s. Yeah. Hey, yes, I remember that. Uh -huh. and I, I had uh -huh. the same reaction, I thought, yeah. because he's older, this is a great yeah. portrayal uh -huh. of this guy who's really seen too much in yeah. his yeah. life. Yeah, he has seen too much, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. So speaking of the time period, though, um, I noticed in, in, in your novels, um, or particularly this one where Archie meets Nero, Nero Wolf, um, that it is set back in, in the Prohibition era. And although, obviously, that's true to the spirit of Nero Wolf, but how, um, I mean, what is it about that era that's appealing? And, and why not take the character or take a story like that and move it up to a more contemporary time? There's something about the 30s that has always fascinated me. And I, and maybe, in fact, I, I really w was gripped by Ken Burns' uh, documentary, documentary on uh, Prohibition that came out in, uh, in the last eight yes, months I, I or so. I saw much of that. Right. And uh, that, that, I don't know, that, that era somehow has just always grabbed me, maybe because I got so fascinated by other detective novels, by Chandler and Hammett mm -hmm. particularly, uh, that, that were set in that era. Uh, there, there, was, uh, there was so much uh, grit and downtroddenness, and, and that gives you I think a lot of material to work with. Well, perhaps also that when we talk about the world weariness, uh, living through the depression, as um, as my mother used to tell me, mm -hmm. was certainly a difficult time. Mm -hmm. And so, a detective who is in the midst of the depression, or shortly thereafter, who has seen it, but also sees this opulent wealth and knows about that disconnection between the average working person and this enormous wealth where so many of these stories are set. Um, I would think that that would create a dynamic tension of its own that gives you ample room to expand a story. Yeah, absolutely. It, it does. And uh, I think we've seen a lot of examples of that. And I, in, in this book, I uh, center the story on the kidnapping of the young son of a very wealthy hotel owner, owner of a hotel chain living out on Long Island. Mm -hmm. And it gives me a chance to take Archie Goodwin from his kind of ratty quarters that he's living in on uh, the upper west side of Manhattan over to uh, great wealth on an eight acre estate in Manhattan. So the, they're, they're, it's fun to play with the contrasts there. Um, in fact, uh, what's interesting about, about the wealth is um, I think it resonates with what we see today in today's society where there is the greatest, in America at least, there's the greatest wealth disparity we've seen since the era of the... Right. Oh, uh, there the, certainly the is. Um, and so I'm just I'm wondering whether we're entering an era now in our own time that might be fertile ground for um, new detective stories. I don't see why not. I, I'm, I doubt that I'll be the one to write them, <laughs> but I, I think there is. I think that is fertile ground. Um, so it's, as you look forward, and how far do you think that you as an author would, would continue to, to take this character? Where do you go from here having written these books? Well, I've finished another Nero Wolf book that is yet to be published. Uh, it, uh, manuscript is completed. At least I think it's completed. The <laughs> editors editor. may, they, they may tell <laughs> me <laughs> wrong. <laughs> but it, this is, they, I, I happen to uh, set this one in 1950. Hmm. So that's about 20 years later than right. this one. And it's another Nero Wolf story. And uh, it is set uh, against the backdrop of a New York state senator, not not a senator not that goes to Washington, but, a, but a, an, an Albany senator who gets 
shot at a baseball game uh, in the polo grounds, mm. which was the home of the New York Giants baseball team for about half the century or more. Before and they moved to San Francisco. Before they moved to San Francisco mm. and uh, broke the hearts of a lot of New Yorkers, <laughs> along with the Dodgers yeah. moving out to, to LA. Los Angeles, right? But uh, I, I had a lot of fun with that. Now that I'm still in the past. I'm not in. Mm -hmm. I'm not in the depression anymore. But I uh, try to lay it in the nineteen in the early. It's set in an unnamed year, but it's about 1950. And what I find interesting about that is it's kind of the opposite of science fiction. When I was a kid, I used to read a lot of science fiction. Mm -hmm. And it's all projected into a future where you get to kind of make up what you want, although, as we all know from most science fiction, it's really just a short leap from where you are today. And most science fiction, even if they think they're looking centuries ahead, uh -huh. are looking about a decade or yeah. two ahead. Yeah, really. uh, yeah. Lot, uh, the world's catching up with some of those writers oh. or has or passed, passed them. them yeah. in many cases. <laughs> yeah, but this is kind of the opposite, where it's almost a, 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 an archaeological dig where you have to go back at that time mm -hmm. and see, well, what really was happening? And, and the country was different. People yeah. thought differently. So how much of that do you need to capture? Well, I, I do a lot of research. I, newspaper microfilm is a wonderful source <laughs> of what was going on in an era. Now, of course, I'm, I'm old enough that I lived through the 50s and, 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 and the 40s, for that matter, and can remember them. but. Uh, I, I want to try to make, a, make it as faithful as possible. And one of the things that you have to be really careful about if you're going to set stories more than a generation earlier than we are, I'd say more, uh, is the language. It changes. Mm -hmm. uh, it's organic. And I am forever going to one of the big dictionaries that I have to find out when a word was coined. Ah. Right, because uh, you can't use it uh, out of context and, or out of error. And, and the big dictionaries like American Heritage and some of the uh, Random House, I think, has a big one. They give you a five-year window on when a word came mm. into proper usage. And I got caught on one. I was, I was writing a book, not a Nero Wolf book, but I was sending it in 1942, and I used the word honcho. Uh, which is sure is pretty common now, and then I realized, wait a minute, I, I better check, and it didn't come into use until between 1945 and 1950. It's a ja I, as I understand it, it's a Japanese word that means boss or leader mm -hmm. or head, and uh, so it, it probably World War II, yes, right? and it right. probably was brought back by the GIs after the war. Sure, but I, I had to change the word. You know, it's, e it's easy to fall into those things. That's yeah. something I wouldn't even think about, but right, that would be a terrible trap. Yeah, how would yeah. you know? You're so used to common yep. usage that we speak every day. Yeah. How would you know that those words weren't used? That's right, and, and that's why those dictionaries with a five-year window mm -hmm. uh, are handy. And In fact, in, in this book, uh, I used, it, it's not in there now, but I used the phrase, he's not the sharpest knife in the drawer. And a very good friend of mine who's a mystery writer who uh, read this, volunteered to read this, uh, sent me an Gotta email. Go. said, Bob, <laughs> that, that word would not have been used in 1930, or that phrase. That, phrase right. That's probably more like 1990. Well, and I think, would think that would be very hard. I mean, how do you catch yourself as you're writing? How do you, how do you do, go through the mental checking exercise of saying, gee, is this legitimate language for that time period? Well, it, you, I, I, I've tried to sensitize myself mm -hmm. to that because I've written um, a number of books that are set in the 30s and mm -hmm. 40s, not just Nero Wolfe's but some other mm -hmm. mysteries. And I, I've gotten so that I, <laughs> I've gotten very gun shy <laughs> about, about words uh, and yeah. phrases, idioms. Uh, idioms can really trip you up. And, and uh, I've seen it in other people's books, of course, and I've you know, been guilty of it myself or almost guilty of it. Uh, fortunately, I, you know, people with a good eye have caught. Well, I had a woman editor who caught me on one, and uh, maybe it was on Hancho, and then this sharp knife in the drawer thing. Right, right. Uh, it's awfully easy to fall into uh, common parlance. Yeah, yeah. Right? and and um, I may have been guilty, uh, without anybody ever mentioning it to me, of slipping something into a book that really would not have belonged at that time. I would time. think it would go the other way as well. There's there are usages that fall out of favor. And so there are a lot of things that people in the 20s or 30s yeah. would have said, or 40s, yeah. 
that yeah. we don't use anymore yeah. today. For instance, in, in, I think in this book I have somebody saying it's Jake with me. I, I saw that, yes. Yeah, and that means it's okay it's with okay. me, and nobody would say it, uh, would use that now. I, that's in fact, I, I had that reaction when I read that okay. phrase. I, th <laughs> I thought, it's Jake, and I thought, I, I had to stop for a minute. I thought, oh, that means it's okay. Right? Yeah. <laughs> right. I think in The Sting, the movie with Robert Redford mm -hmm. and Paul Newman, I think one of them used, it's Jake it's with Jake. me. Yeah, of course, that was yeah. set in the, in the Prohibition the era. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, um, so uh, we only have a, a few minutes left, but I'm, I'm curious about... Uh, um, your, your other body of work, we talked a lot about Nero Wolf, uh -huh. but um, in a few minutes we have left, uh, I mean, uh, tell me about some of the other things that you do and, and, and when you feel that you need to step out of the Nero Wolf world and do some other things. Which I did. I, st I did the Nero Wolf books or originally. I did seven of them. Uh, not too long after Mr. Stout died, mm -hmm. I, I did them with the approval of the estate because they own the character. But then I decided I wanted to try my own character and I created, I, I worked for the Chicago Tribune mm -hmm. for more than 20 years and I created a Chicago Tribune police reporter named Malik. Uh, my, I'm Bohemian on my mother's side mm -hmm. and so I made him a Bohemian from Chicago and he uh, is in five books that are set in the 19th, late 30s and through the f decade of the 40s and I set them against the backdrop of Chicago scenes and, and I mix real people like Al Capone and mm -hmm. Dizzy Dean the baseball player mm -hmm. and uh, Enrico Fermi and Frank Lloyd Wright they pass through these books and interface with my fictional characters and I that was fun to do because I love Chicago history and I spent a lot of time on microfilm of <laughs> old pa copies of the Tribune and other papers to find out what was going on in the city in 1938 or 1942 I would think even the geography of the city, you have to be aware of what's there. I mean, the, there's landfill, there are buildings where there used to be lakefront. Yeah, that's right. Um, the, the river has changed, uh, the, the buildings around the river have changed dramatically. Yeah, the, the city's organic just like the language is, it that's right. It changes over yeah, time. Yeah. Right? And I do, the, I do the same with New York in the Nero Wolf books. I, I try to make sure that things I'm writing about uh, were there then. And, uh, and, yes, and I noticed that in, in the, the book Archie Meets Nero, it's the, the brand new Chrysler building. Yeah, 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 yeah that's right. <laughs> I, I like yeah. that. And the Empire State Building isn't, is yet to be built. Yes, isn't built yet. Yeah, and I mentioned the, the, the almost new uh, Holland Tunnel. Yes. Because it had just been just, built yeah. in the three or four years before that. Yeah. Well, Mr. Goldsboro, believe it or not, our time is already up. Okay, well, so it's been a great it's pleasure. It's been a pleasure you. for me. It's flown well, thank by. You. Thank, you. Oh, thank you. I hope you come back, and I, I wish you be best of luck on being uh, continuing to be a prolific author. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And thank you for joining us once again on Public Perspective. I'm your host, Kevin McDermott. You can find us every Saturday night at 8 on Comcast Channel 19, and you can find us on the web at publicperspective.tv. Till next time, thank you, and good night.